Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to Digital Tabletop Fest 3. Uh, my name is Thomas Rawlings, and I'm the studio director at Auroc Digital. And we have a fantastic discussion today about cards, card games. The uh, official title is Blood on the Cards, Conflict and Competition in Card Games. And I think card games are a great opportunity to talk about how you create tension and competition and a bit of playing blood on, on the table, so to speak. So um, I'd like to ask uh, my my uh, esteemed guests to introduce themselves and I'll, I'll start with uh, you Frank if you could just introduce yourself say a little bit about you know who you are and what it is you do and why you've got an interest in card games. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to be a part of this. So my name is Frank West, and I run a board game publishing company in the UK called The City of Games. And I started off as a video gamer. You know, I grew up playing video games my entire life. I was lucky to grow up with that console generation. And then probably 10 to 15 years ago, I suddenly discovered hey, there's some really cool board games these days. You know, these physical games are starting to really evolve far beyond what I remembered as a child to these video game-esque physical adaptations. And I just got really stuck into it. I started buying lots of games, playing lots of games. And as someone who wanted to design games for my entire life, I just started designing board games instead of video games, switched over, and I was stuck in the hotel for a few months and was like, this is it. This is the moment I'm going to change my life and start publishing board games and it's been great um obviously lots of physical stuff and we'll, we'll talk about the card details in a little bit but that's yeah. a bit about who i am wonderful and uh yeah and welcome and i would say to all listeners do check out the link uh which is in the in the event description to uh frank's stuff and i can heartily recommend city of cats it's a fantastic game uh okay and and also joining us is uh, Andres, if you want to introduce yourself and, and you know, what, what's your interest in card games? Sure. So I'm Andres Tallos. I'm the founder and CEO of Everguild, uh, which is a video games uh, developer and publisher. And well, all we do is card games. Uh, I used to be a big fan as a player of uh, physical uh, traded card games like Magic Gathering, Doom Trooper, Vampire, um, the, the, a lot of them for many years. I never really expected it to be useful in my professional life. Um, but then when we uh, uh, founded Everguild and we were figuring out which uh, game we wanted to do for, for mobile at the time, that was uh, what we had experience on. We, that was the time when Hearthstone was coming out of beta. And for us, Hearthstone was obviously an eye opener because there had been many digital games before. But in our view, Hearthstone was the first to really make a trading card game or a collectible card game feel native to um, the, the digital sphere as opposed to being a bit of a port of a physical card game and at that time Hearthstone was available on PC and an iPad but not yet on, on the broader mobile uh, devices so we figured out it was an opportunity to, to do something like a card game but much more optimized for, by, uh, for mobile and so we released the first game called Dragon Lords which was um, successful enough to allow us to get a licensing agreement with Games Workshop to do another card game in a similar kind of style, but this time using the Horus Heresy IP. Um, that's part of the Warhammer 40,000 universe. So we released uh, Horus Heresy Legions almost five years ago now. And while well, the game has been like growing since uh, it launched and we've been like releasing expansions for it and it's been doing great. And actually it's allowed us to now get to another licensing agreement with Games Workshop to do um, the next game, which is called Warhammer 40,000 Warforge, which will again be a card game. But this time we are going um, PC first, um, although the plan is to make it cross-platform with mobile as well later on. And we are trying to raise the, the bar in terms of production levels and, and basically take everything we've learned um, all these years about card games. Um, to try to make it an even better game. Brilliant. And again, uh, the game is great, and, and, and you can check out the links um, to, uh, to, to all of the work that uh, Evergild are doing. Um, so, yeah, look in the, the, the show notes there, and you'll see them there. I'm going to take a step back for a moment. Like, I was, you know, before this event, I was sort of looking, I was kind of interested in well, how long have we been playing card games as humans? And the earliest records that we've got is somewhere around the Tang Dynasty in China, around the ninth century, um, and it came out of wood woodblock printing technology. That there were these um, that people started to make some kind of cards 
and playing games with them. So it's at least, you know, around about 1,200 years old, but probably older than that. You know, we just maybe don't have the evidence. And that kind of blows my mind a bit that here we are, you know, well over a thousand years, maybe as much as a thousand and a half years later, we're still using this idea of little bits of paper or whatever material we might have used in, in early parts of history to make games. Like, why, why, do, why do you think, you know, this concept of a card is still getting people's blood flowing as a thing they want to want to play with all this time later. I mean, Frank, you know, you're you're a physical game designer. What, why why do you think we're still using this format? I think that playing cards just offer so much variability in what you can do with them. So, you know, if you play a video game, you've got menus, you've got panels, you can press a button, you can see more options. But when you're playing with physical pieces, you don't have infinite space. You can't make things float in front of your eyes just yet. Maybe AR can do that kind of stuff. But generally speaking, you can't. And cards give you this ability to store endless information in a discoverable way in a very small format they allow you to have imagery they allow you to have text they allow you to have iconography they allow you to discover them from a random perspective where you shuffle the deck they allow you to discover them from an ordered perspective where the deck comes in order you have hidden information where they're face down or in your hand you have public information where they're available on the table so they're very very kind of fluid in the way you can use them the way you can present information the pros and cons of how they can be used, I think just makes them super, super versatile. And because of that, when you're trying to design a physical game, they just give you so many options in a very kind of familiar way. Not to mention, obviously, holding them in your hands is super simple. If I say to you, go and pick up 200 dice, you're going to really struggle to hold those in your hands and then find that specific one. But if I say to you, pick up 200 cards, then most people are going to find that fine. They're going to be able to discover and go through those cards quite quickly. So I just think they're really, really versatile, really flexible. And that just kind of gives access to lots of different kind of um, ways that you can use them. That's, that's great. That's really fascinating. And, and Andres, I don't know if you've had thoughts on this as well yourself, you know, um, you know, Frank's, I think, laid out a really good case of their flexibility, their versatility, their convenience. I mean, what would your thoughts be? I was saying that I completely agree with all that. And I, per I would perhaps emphasize the element of randomness that you can put into a game in a way that feels extremely intuitive. So just by, ha like, for example, having a set deck of cards, but just by shuffling it, you are adding an amazing amount of randomness uh, so that each game will play differently but in a way that feels very, very easy to understand, very intuitive. And, and you can even um, try to do the math to see, okay, like how likely it is that the next car will be the one I want. So I think that element of randomness, um, it's, it's intrinsic and, and very helpful for game design. And on top of that, I would say for collectible car games, um, the collectible aspect for some reason for cards, it also feels like a very, very intrinsic, like to, to human nature, to want to have that collection of, of cards, even if um, like, if they are just like cards that you don't play with, uh, we still want those like football player cards or, or whatever it is that we like collecting. So I think that's, that's a strong element as well that cards uh, provide. That's a great, that's a great point. Yeah. I think that adds into it. And, and I, I think that for me, you know, the, the, the other thing that I find really useful, you know, and having designed a couple of card games as well myself, is as soon as you put something in a card, you're you're immediately communicating something to a player. They get this is a thing they're going to manipulate somehow. All the other players are going to do it. It's like there's a kind of language now of cards, if you see what I mean. Like, uh, and, and that I find really fascinating. But then the the other thing that when I was thinking about card games, is uh, you know the first card card game I can ever remember playing has got to be Snap. I don't know whether you, yourselves that that was your first, but it's a you know it's really as a kid it's obviously really simple. As soon as the cards match, you go snap first. But it's it's head to head. It's competition. It's like who can slap their hand down the first. You know, and as kids, we're probably trying to slap our hands down too hard on each other to, you know, add to the, the gameplay. And then I think the next card game I probably learned was Pontoon. You know, twenty one where you've got to get twenty one. But again, it's head to head. And then poker, I think. Um, so I was thinking about a lot of the card games I've played are quite competitive. And, and you know, 
taking that idea of why the card's so useful, what what why do you think the card most of the card games we we see around are competitive? Is there something about the card format that lends itself to competition? I mean, Andres, the games that you you your your company are doing are of a competitive, you know, that, that there's blood on the cards, should we say, to go to the theme. You know, why why do you think cards suit that competitive, not just gameplay, but competitive gameplay? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, players like uh, multi, like PvP games, uh, like the competition element, whether it's uh, in video games or in physical games, I think that there's a lot of players who enjoy that. And then when we think about how to design like a, a competitive game, especially a turn-based game, so that without including elements of like physical skill or, or reflexes, just like a turn-based game. Um, we always think about like what weight we want to assign to the player's skill, like uh, mental skill and coming up with the right strategy versus this like random factor that I mentioned earlier versus an additional element which matters a lot in, in especially in free-to-play games, which is, is the... The progression like how many cards do you own or how what level they have so how far you've made it into the game whether it's by playing or by spending money right and i think cards um, really allow us to bring in an element of randomness and also an element of progression in a way that feels natural and to some extent fair in the sense that if say you've spent more time or more money into the game and you have more cards, that doesn't automatically translate into you winning the game because you still need to know how to build your deck, you still need to know how to use them in battle. So it's not an automatic, like I'm level 15 and you're level 13, so I beat you. So I think the, the cards lend themselves really well to having these like PvP games that seem like are based on skill, but they have this element of randomness, which um, like really makes them more accessible to a lot of players. There's many players who enjoy chess, right? Like no luck, just like a skill. But there's a lot more players who prefer like poker or <laughs> some other game where luck is involved. And you know that even if your level of skill is perhaps a bit lower than the opponent, you still have a chance at winning. So there's um, like cards really allow us to bring in these, these formats in a way that is intuitive. To, to people, mostly because they've played them before in other games, but partly because the cards themselves um, really allow us to bring these elements in a, in a very natural way. No, that's a great, great point. I, I don't know whether you had thoughts on that, Frank, about why card games do seem to work so well for a competitive format. Yeah, I think for me, coming at this from like a physical side, um, there's a couple of things that are a little bit different to the video game side. So the first would probably just be the age, like you said, you know, playing cards have been around for a thousand plus years. And from my experience, um, like cooperative games, games where we're playing together are much more of a newer thing. Like competitive sports were much more of like the common thing for hundreds of years. And if you look at the board game world, it's only in the last five to 10 years where cooperative games have really started coming into it. And I think that just is that historic element of cards where it's like we're used to cards being competitive and as such they've kind of really built these kind of competitive games that have just had much more time to kind of flower into something that's like really incredible designs what's now we're seeing more and more cooperative games coming out of them that work really well but I think the second part for me about why cards work really well, and this is something that I would say about, say, Magic the Gathering. Magic the Gathering is obviously a card game that's been around for more years than I'd like to admit these days, a long, long time. And it's a game that is very, very famous. Every year they bring out more cards and my collection grows and grows and grows. But what works really well in a game like that is you and me are having a battle, right? We're at the table, we're thinking, we're outwitting each other, and then suddenly I draw a card. And if I look at that card, I can see on the card everything it does. And if it's something new or it's something complicated, it's likely to explain how it works or what it does in words on the card. Because there's nothing worse than me like grabbing a token from a bag, seeing an icon, and then looking at you and going, um... 
you know, this isn't relevant to the current situation, but could you just remind me how fireballs work again? Because at that point, you know, that battle is lost. You know how it works. You know what I've got. And I think that cards just provide a format that allow you not to have to ask those questions and as much, and it gives you a more competitive platform where you're not having to reveal information. And I feel that's, for me, a really powerful part of cards is it gives you that extra step. No, that's a great point. And I, and I think, you know, going to as well, the, the card format, like, uh, you know, I used to play Magic the Gathering a lot more than I do now. I think one of the things I noticed that was really clever in that is, you know, obviously you build your own deck with it and that's a big part of why it's an enjoyable game. But that, you know, it's that thing where you can have loads and loads of cards, but if you put too many cards in, you start diluting down those good cards or the probability of those great combinations of good cards coming together. Or, you know, you if you you know it, it forces you to have a nice balance across all your cards you know with land and effects and everything like that and I, I thought that's good but you're right it's it's been going for a while and it's testament to the brilliant gameplay at the heart of of magic the gathering that it, it's still going for so long <clears throat> um i mean the you know just before we move on to uh, a little more of it just just still on the, this this concept of the competitive stuff like you know, we, we've seen, like, what, you know, you're right, there's a lot of great cooperative games been coming out recently, and that, that has been fascinating to see. What I've also sort of noticed, you know, and it's been around for a while, but it certainly seems to be growing, is just how big the competitive scenes for some of these card games is, you know, and obviously poker, you know, it's televised now, <laughs> um, but obviously Magic the Gathering and things like that, they're, they're sizable scenes with lots of people playing. Um, I don't know if, if, if you've ever had an experience of that more competitive play or watched any of it or anything like that. Um, Andres, you know, have you had a chance to play any competitive play or seen it? Yeah, I mean, not at a very high level, and it wasn't on, on games as big as Magic, but both on Doom Trooper and Vampire Eternal Struggle. Uh, I did pa take part in, in tournaments relative, like, very frequently at the national level in Spain. And yeah, that was a big part of the hobby, really, because um, it's even though when you are playing for fun with friends, um, like we still usually took it seriously and tried to win. But um, it's when you have like this structure format of a tournament that it really raises the stakes, even if there are in big prices. But the fact that you have like strict rules, every not, everybody knows that you're playing to win, um, it really it really matters. And I think um, that's something that, for example, in, in our games now, we also try to bring in, like having this sense and, and enabling players to organize their tournaments because it's a very different mindset that you have when you are playing the game um, that way. No, that's interesting. And just final, you know, on this, did that, that experience playing those tournaments, do you think that's led into the kind of work that you're doing now? Has that influenced... Has that competitive play experience influenced how you're working now? Yeah, I think it it does um, because again, I think and, and partly it's because the like the normal way to play video games is a bit more long term, a bit less focused on on just like say one weekend or one day having a tournament, and it's more about like having a month long or or longer um, leaderboard where try players are trying to to be at the top, but it requires um, like persistence, <laughs> it's less uh, constraint in time. Um, I, I think it's a very different way to approach it uh, in a way. And, and even when you're building the deck um, that you're, want, you're planning to use, you're, you're prioritizing different things. Like your win rate matters much more when it's only like five or six games. And especially if you know that you lose one, you're out, right? So it's, it's definitely something we have in mind when, when both when it comes to the card design to the individual cards but also to the to the mechanics that we put in the game to allow them to do like different types of matches that's that's, that's really interesting and, and frank you said you you play a lot of magic the gathering um you know has that influenced your design work and your kind of how you approach it uh, you know that experience 
Yeah, I think that, I mean, for me, I've not played Magic for a few years now, but I very much played it for a considerable amount of time when I was younger. And, you know, and I competed in some kind of local regional tournaments for Magic and kind of, I got very, very much into it. I mean, I still have 20, 25,000 cards now. So I think that people would probably describe me as a more than the average person, but not, not too deep into it. So I think that, what I've seen is this big change, and this is both for video games and board games. Board games are probably 10 years behind video games, maybe 15 years behind in this, but it's the general, um, like, exception of them from the general public, right? It's people not seeing this as a quirky hobby. It's people not seeing it as something to be judged, but it's that ability to do it. When I was playing Magic the Gathering, I was at secondary school and me and my friend used to play and we were the only two people, there was three of us out of about 950 students that played Magic the Gathering. And at lunchtimes, we'd have to beg teachers that we could have a table in like the corner of a classroom because we wanted to play and you couldn't do it out in public because people would just come around and mock you and say silly things. But these days, you know, me and my friends will happily just go and sit in a pub or take a game with us and we'll play it and no one will make comment and if they do more often than not is asking for more information as people wanting to know what you're doing because it sounds cool and sounds exciting so i think that tournaments in the competitive nature have grown because people are allowed to come out of their shells more you know it's the same with esports like esports are so so big these days i remember when i used to download like the korean starcraft tournaments from 20 plus years ago and just try and watch them and people would be like what on earth are you watching like what is this but now people enjoy it and for me having competed in those kind of basic levels back then it just kind of really opened my eye to you know, this is an acceptable thing to do. Like, if you want to build your career out of this, that's absolutely fine because it's a skill, just like playing football, just like swimming at the Olympics, you know, racing cars. It is a skill to be able to play a game well and to be able to design a game that allows people to get that invested in it is an incredible accomplishment. You know, very few games manage to reach those levels where the game is good enough, balanced enough, interesting enough, and has that wider reach that the real true competitive tournaments can come out of that. That's great. And that's a great segue to talking into kind of like, start to talk a little bit about some of the design aspects of, of, of card games now. Like, it, so we, we did, a, I've, I've designed a few, a few card games, um, Agatha Christie, Death on the Cards, um, the Mars Rising Blast Off, which is a great one to talk about. And we've got Mars Rising 2, which we announced. Go and wish list, please. Um, but in, in the, the physical game of Mars Rising um, Blast Off, what happens early on in it is you, in order to get missions done, you need to get a rocket. And that rocket has to match the capacity of the mission you've got to do. It's got to be able to get where you've got to go. And it's got to take the payload you need to do. So the, the two have got to match. So what happens early on in the game is as people start building up their stuff, get a period where there's loads of people are building stuff up but they don't have quite the rocket to get there and as soon as the right rocket arrives everybody's kind of diving in and going and i was really pleased with how that works because it creates this really nice set you know the randomness of the cards that you talked about Anders, like that 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 naturally creates these ebbs and flows in the games where there's these pushes of drama um that suddenly happened i was really pleased with with how that worked out um i don't know if if, if in your own work or again you've you've played or enjoyed where there's a moment where that particular thing of the, the some aspect of the card thing, you're like, yeah, that worked really, really well. Um, Andres, is there something in the you know the games that that yourselves have been working on where there's like a card or a moment in a card where you're like, yeah, that design worked great. Yeah, no, certainly. I mean, with Horus Heresy Legions, we've released so many cards already uh, throughout like these last almost five years from different armies with so many different mechanics that, I mean, there's there's quite a few that we are quite proud of. Um, some others that didn't work out exactly as expected. Um, but generally we have this challenge of doing, um, basically mixing the just the pure mechanics of it. So making a mechanic that's easy to understand, that has an interesting effect in game, um, there's there's all these elements, but also mixing it with the fact that it makes sense to players, right? Because it fits the the lore of the particular army, how they expect things to work, or or as you describe with the rocket. So when things just make intuitive sense, you read them, and that that's I think for us the 
the key that we're trying to, to achieve, right? That and when we get that and, and players see it and say, oh, wow, this makes sense. This fits this army perfectly. Um, it, it leads to the kind of um, gameplay and play style that I would expect them to have. Then it's like all the pieces of the puzzle <laughs> fit perfectly. And, and that's when I think we're, we're most proud of. And there's, there's several examples there. Um, but then there's another aspect uh, as well that we try to achieve, and sometimes it's much more subtle. When, for example, with Legions, since we were focusing on mobile first, uh, one priority was to make the matches as quick as possible. We didn't want the games to go on for 15 or 20 minutes. And so there are some subtle things we've done there, um, like increasing the number of cards you can draw versus your average game, which means you have more options. It's easier to end the game when it gets to a certain point or reducing the amount of uh, ways you can heal your, your hero so that the game doesn't go on for too long. There's, there's a number of things which are not explicit. They are much more subtle in how the, the different mechanics are designed and different cards that don't, not always <laughs> achieve the desired outcome, but we, we track those and, and we also try to make sure that those are working the way we want. And, and, and we are also quite proud as well when we when we get those working and we get the games lasting like three or four minutes instead of 15. And, and those are way less explicit and, and I think uh, obvious to players. Brilliant. Uh, what about in your work, Frank? Is, is there a particular moment where you've been like, yeah, that, that's cool. Very happy with how that worked out. Yeah, it's interesting. I've been thinking of a few different things, but the, the core one that comes to me is actually from the Art of Cats. So the Art of Cats is a game where you are going to an island, it's about to be attacked. You can't stop the attack, but you can save all the cats on the island and get them off, get them onto your boat and sail away before they turn up. And the interesting thing with the Art of Cats is at its heart, there is a card system that drives all of your decisions. And none of the cards individually are that complex. None of the cards really do anything clever. But what I find fascinating is the way those cards interact with each other and the decisions they place upon a player. So at the start of the game, you're going to get given seven cards and you're going to look at those seven cards and you're going to choose two of them. And those two cards are the cards that you're going to get to play. You're then going to get given more cards, choose two more and so on to build up your hand. But what those cards do is they give you completely different options. So one option would be the ability to rescue a cat. So you have a basket that you can put the cat in to carry it back. Another one is the ability to generate fish and you have to feed fish to the cats to get them to go into your baskets. And the third card is a card that gives you a way of scoring points. So for example, if you get five of a certain type of cat, or if you manage to put three of a certain thing in a certain position on your boat, but what happens is when you look at these cards individually, I can carry a cat, I can feed a cat, or I can get points from a cat. And if you only take all of one type, you're not going to do anything because you can carry lots of cats, but you can't feed them. Or if you can feed lots of cats, you can't carry them. Or I've got loads of cards that give me the ability to score points, but I don't have any of the cats I need to score those points. And what I find is this system is fascinating because players will look there and they'll be like, right, well, I need a cat. I need to feed a cat and I need to be able to score points from that cat. And as you play through the game and these options come in, even though individually those options are very simple, it creates this really complex decision where you're trying to push your luck. You know, you're saying, oh, well, this point scoring card is too good to pass up. And I'm definitely sure I can do this one as well. And suddenly you've got like nine of those that you've taken and you can't get these cats. And suddenly you get something that gives you loads of fish, but you need to have this other thing. And just the decisions that come from those basic options, I think I really love in that game. And I think is a really fascinating thing that cards allow you to do. That's great. That's a great description. Um, well, at this, this point, and uh, you, a, a good sort of segue from here would be actually, if you, Frank, if you wanted to kind of um, run a little bit into, you know, you know, the, the, the other work you've been doing is obviously Isle of Cats, you mentioned, which is a great game. But that's not the only game you've been working on or you, you, you've, you've published. Could you tell us a little bit more about what's out there and, you know, where the cards feature in that? 
Yeah, so I've currently got four games that have been published. The fifth one is coming out in a few months, and they're called The City of Kings, which was my first game, Vidoran Gardens, The Art of Cats, and Explore and Draw. The City of Kings is, is kind of the one I'll focus on for this, because for me, as I said at the start of this, I come from a video game world. You know, I was someone who has 400 days played in World of Warcraft, and I'm not ashamed of that. I enjoyed that game. I loved that game. And many other games I've invested great deals of my life into. And I come from a... Um, tech world you know i did computer science i built an ai system for real-time strategy games for my um degree at university and i always wanted to make video games and i always wanted to make my own mmorpg i'm sure lots of people have that dream but i was also very aware that i realistically i probably needed a few hundred million pounds and a larger team than i could kind of put together and when i got into board gaming i was kind of like wow you know these games are starting to do what those kind of video games can do. So I wanted to create an MMORPG as a physical board game. And that's what the City of Kings kind of started off with. It's very much a very puzzly game. And I would liken it to exploration, but then also kind of like raid bosses. So if you imagine like a raid instance where you're going through and you're fighting a boss and then the next boss. So it's about these big battles it's not about let's kill hundreds of creatures and chuck dice it's more about how do we get past this one creature how do we define like the options what is our strategy and how do we overcome that but as a kind of RPG with this exploration factor, cards allow you to instill kind of discovery. So as an example, cards are used for equipment. In a video game, a piece of equipment will drop on the floor. And one of the cool things is to be able to see that piece of equipment, is to be able to look at it and see how it's going to feel on your character. Of course, the stats are important, you know, how much it's going to cost you to use it if you meet the requirements. And cards are used in the City of Kings as a really nice way to show strong visuals of what this world looks like it allows you to really immerse yourself into the hey i've picked up this sword and it looks really cool and i'm going to put it with my character and it's going to look great cards are also used for quests so as you discover kind of you know npcs that are going to want you to do stuff they inject story and a great kind of thing about these as we said earlier is, you know you can have this huge deck of cards and as you um, discover a quest location you just take one and then it gives you a narrative it gives you objectives it gives you what you need to do and it allows you to put it to a side until you complete that so cards are used in kind of ways of injecting like complex deep levels of information to kind of build immersion whilst the game itself sits on the table and doesn't take up as much space as if you had all these menus and all these things kind of permanently out there and finally cards in that game are used for the skill tree and this is something that i really really like because as you level up you unlock skills, the ability to kind of like make your character more powerful with special abilities that you're going to be able to do stuff. And this is all done by taking cards that have basically nodes on them. And as you level up more, you're going to take more of these cards and you're going to build up a node tree on your character. And then you're going to be able to unlock those different nodes. And as you progress through that pathway, they give you access to new skills, new stats and so on. And what cards do there is they create this sense of randomness where you're never going to have the same skill tree twice because because the way you build it up is different, but there's a controlled factor to it where you know it's always going to have these kind of options and this kind of system. So within the City of Kings, cards are used in lots and lots of different ways. And that's really exciting to me because, again, they're just such a great versatile component that adds that kind of flexibility. That's great. That's a great summary of, of, of you know what you've been doing and how it relates to it. And again, thoroughly recommend people check out Frank's work. Um, Andre, do you want to tell us a little bit about the games that you've got out there as well? You've kind of obviously talked about it already so far, but great summary of, of, of what's out there and what people can expect. No, absolutely. So obviously I've talked perhaps a bit more about uh, Horus Heresy Legions uh, because it's been out for a long time now and we keep releasing, by the way, we are in the middle of releasing a new content expansion, which is actually a great time for new players to come in because we are kind of um, re-releasing the first uh, legions that came into the game so we've completely um, redone all the onboarding and the tutorial and, and it looks way better um, than it used to and also the, I think the mechanics are much more um, polished now for all these cards so it's it's uh, that's that's a life and kicking but then we also have uh, Warp Forge coming up which 
I mean, I just want to make clear, it's not like a reskin of the game. It's a completely new game. We are rebuilding, basically we are doing everything we always wanted to do and couldn't, <laughs> but in the Warhammer 40,000 uh, setting. So way more immersive in terms of the scenarios that we are creating, the voiceovers, the music, all the visual effects. So, so we are really investing in, in creating this kind of uh, 40K uh, atmosphere. And also on the, on the cards themselves, we've, we really always make a, a huge, or we put a lot of emphasis on making sure that the, the IP is as well represented as possible in the sense, like, for example, we are including the new mechanic, which didn't exist in Legions and in any other game, as far as I'm aware of um, another CCG, where when you're attacking with a unit, you have two stats. You have a melee attack and a range attack, and then you can choose which one of the two to use. And this is something that comes super natural to someone who's played the, the tabletop version of uh, Warhammer, because obviously units there also have range or melee attacks. And so we've brought that into the card game. Um, and it's still a card game in most ways, but when you are playing it, it feels like really immersive as if you are actually having like a Warhammer 40k uh, battle. And one element as well, which I think is super important when it comes to collectible card games, um, is the creativity involved in building your deck or, or putting together your deck. This is something that um, I think we, we learned along the way. We, we initially underestimated how important it was for players. Like the, all, like There's a lot of yourself that you pour into <laughs> creating your deck, right? And one thing we found out is that, for example, like every now and then we will have to do balance changes and make some cards stronger or weaker to, to rebalance the game. Um, and generally what we've found is that players understand that and are okay with that for the most part. Um, but they are really upset when a deck they had created um, no longer makes sense. It can be a bit weaker now than it used to, but it has to still play well. When So if we change a card to do something very different than before and suddenly it makes no sense to have it in your deck, that really feels like we are almost like taking away the creation, right? So it's something we've uh, we're we're kind of learning um, from a lot from like how our experience with legions and obviously our experience playing other games and and what other games are doing, which is something we always keep our eye on as well, trying to learn from um, like all the the other games, their updates or, or new entrants in the market. Yeah, that's, that's a great summary of stuff. And, and yeah, I, I think it's a good opportunity to kind of uh, draw to a close where we are with that. Uh, and so uh, unless there's any other points people wanted to say of the things that people should check out. Sorry, just just one note I forgot to mention. So even though Warpforge is in development, we're actually going to have a demo available during the, the Tabletop Fest on ah. Steam. So we encourage everyone to go have a look. There's going to be um, stuff uh, like uh, several armies that people can play with, both uh, competitive like and, and draft mode. So really encourage everyone to try it out. Brilliant. And the links for all that will be here. So both on the Steam page and in the event listing for this will be links to Frank's work, links to Andre's work, links to our work. I encourage everybody to check all those out. Uh, and then, yeah, all that remains for me to do is, is just to say a big thank you to Frank, a big thank you to Andres uh, for your time. Really appreciate it. And uh, thanks very much. Thank you very much for having us.